Hey everybody, welcome to Graceway Online. We are so glad that you're here today. Joining us on demand is awesome, but did you know that we go live every Sunday at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Central Standard Time? Every Sunday, our online host team is available to chat and pray with you. To join us live, go to live.visitgraceway.org or catch us on Facebook. It looks like the experience is starting right now, so let's get ready for Graceway Online. finish up our series worship and wisdom which is the third in four a four series set teaching you through the old testament the first was ancestors you can find this uh, on our website visit graceway.org uh, ancestors teaching you through genesis and all the way to deuteronomy then we looked at kings and judges looked at judges all the way through esther and now we're in this third set talking about wisdom literature this this five book set in scripture in the canon of scripture that's known as wisdom literature from job to song of solomon now you probably have noticed that we did not put song of solomon into uh this series mostly because i'm scared to death to preach it. i'm just gonna be entirely honest with you. i'm kidding uh we're gonna do it on february 16th two days after valentine's day and i want to encourage you whether you are married not married want to be married we're married now you're not married this is I'm going to make this as absolutely helpful as I can if you're a parent. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to use any terms you're going to have to explain at lunch or anything like that. But the Song of Solomon really is God's way of doing love and marriage and pleasure. Now, I want you to understand why this is important, because the world has a way of doing love and marriage and pleasure, and you hear it every day whether you acknowledge or understand it or not. Uh, but we need a word from God on these issues. And so if you're dating, if you'd like to date, if you're married, if you'd like to be married, any of those issues, I promise that's going to be helpful for you. But today we're going to talk about Ecclesiastes. And so I want you to get over to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1 and verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. You can just go out to the Next Steps desk. We'll give you one for free. But in Ecclesiastes, chapter 1 and verse 1, it begins this way. The words of the preacher the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So I want to start just with the title of the book, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes comes from a Greek word that is this, this individual indicating a person calling an assembly. And so you can think of it one of two ways. You can think of it as somebody who's had uh, affluence and influence and experience kind of calling everybody into a large room to kind of disseminate to them wisdom and experience. The other way that I like to think about it is a little bit more relational. This is Solomon at the end of his life just kind of laying out with great transparency his experience is good, bad, and ugly. And I, I picture him kind of like an old grandfather, right, sitting at a, at a very nice uh, rocking chair in front of a very expensive fireplace and kind of calling us over, handing us a clip of hot chocolate and saying, I want to just, there's some things that I want to tell you. There's some things that I want you to understand uh, based on what I know of God and of life and of humanity and the human experience. And, and, and it's a beautiful and, and wonderful and helpful and wise way to look at it. So the author is Solomon, the son of David, the king of Jerusalem. And Solomon's especially interesting because in 1 Kings chapter 3, he's just become king of Israel and God comes to him and God says, right, listen, I'll give you essentially uh, one request. I'll give you one wish and whatever you ask me for, I'll give you. And some of you are like, where do I sign up for that, right? Can I have God do that? And Solomon asks for wisdom. Solomon asked for wisdom. It's like Solomon knew James chapter 1 and verse 5, if any lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Solomon, a newly anointed king over God's people, says, I don't know how to do this. And God says, that is the correct answer. And because you ask for wisdom, and not for money or power or success, I'm going to give you wisdom and money and power and success. I love this because Solomon is an indication to us that when we don't know how to do something and ask God, God always answers us. It's an encouraging thing. And so Solomon is, is, is a leader early in his life. He says, I don't know how to do this. And God says, I got you. I, I'm, I'm going to help you with this. And out of that reality, the supernatural engiftment of wisdom 
uh, Solomon writes or contributes to three of the five wisdom books in Scripture. I think he probably wrote Song of Solomon when he was young. If you've read it, you know why I think that, right? I think he wrote Proverbs throughout his life, and I think Ecclesiastes is toward the end of his life. And he's looking back over his life, and he's wanting to give us his, his, his experiences and his understanding and the wisdom that God gave him at the beginning of his life. He's now utilizing it to look back, and he's gifting it to us in 12 chapters called Ecclesiastes. So why is this book important? I want to give you four things. The first is that I think that Ecclesiastes is a wise man's transparency. Ecclesiastes is a wise man's transparency. Now, what, what do I mean by that? Uh, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I typically find the most transparent people to be the most foolish people. Have you ever had that happen? Like, you're completely transparent saying nothing that I want to hear. No, just me? Okay, maybe not. Maybe, maybe y'all, okay? I, I've also found that, uh, that wise people tend to not be as transparent. It's either complete transparency and no wisdom, or a lot of wisdom and no transparency. In fact, Proverbs says this, that we, we even consider a fool wise when they keep their mouth shut, right? And, and I've noticed that people with a lot of wisdom and a lot of experience aren't always the most generous, the most honest, the most transparent. Solomon is this really potent and helpful uh, ingredient of, of wisdom and of transparency. And, and why do I think this is important? Um, some of you are, are sitting in the room today, and, and by God's grace, we've got uh, people from all different countries and traditions and cultures and age. And, and, and you have had experiences that have given you wisdom that those of us under a certain age don't, don't have. And, and let me tell you what I think the enemy loves to do, uh, especially toward the end of your life. He, he does one of two things. Okay, you've had your run, and now you're done. Let the youngins take it. And that's not in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. If you're still breathing, God still has plans for you. Uh, the other is that he, he, he kind of isolates uh, as, as we get a little bit older. And, and so let me just ask you, uh, really beg you, if I could, that if you're of a certain age where you've had certain experiences, we have a generation who needs your wisdom and your transparency. And the enemy says, yeah, you, you know how to do that but nobody wants to hear it, or there are things that you feel like, if you're completely honest with them, it will shame and dishonor you. Can I tell you that's the enemy? Because when you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, I thought some stuff, did some stuff, believed some stuff, that you're like, that is not a good idea. And he's like, I know. That's why I want you to know it. And so we're living in a culture right now that really only wants to promote its successes. It's called social media. And can I tell you, we're glad for your successes, but we also need your failings that God's still been faithful through. And so if, you, if, you're, if you're like, man, I've gone through a divorce, please tell, tell us, okay? Man, I, man I, I went bankrupt. Man, I, I, I did this or I did that. Or I've had this hurt or this habit or this hang-up or this addiction, right? The enemy wants you to stay silent with that. The Ecclesiastes is the exact opposite, that we glean from the faithfulness of God. John 8 and verse 32 says that, that if you understand it and receive the truth, it will, what? It'll set you free. It'll set you free. And the truth that I messed up, but God's still faithful. The truth that I messed up, but God restored. The truth that it, I didn't think there was any way out, but, but God showed up and did an incredible thing. Listen, don't keep that a secret. We need that. We need that. And the enemy wants to keep it just between you and yourself. Ecclesiastes describes life after the Garden of Eden up into heaven. And everything in between. 26 times Solomon uses the phrase under the sun. And he basically identifies all of the different macro elements of the human experience. Ambition and pursuits, changing of seasons of life, life cycle, uh, dissatisfaction, feelings of emptiness, feelings of meaninglessness, feelings of, I thought this was going to be the thing that was going to fix it, and it didn't. And what Solomon does is he speaks with incredible, almost embarrassing candor to give us wisdom in the midst of it. Number two, Solomon Ecclesiastes gives us the benefit of experience without the price tag. Gives us the benefit of experience without the price tag. Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 13 Solomon, wisest guy, God-given wisdom, says, I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom everything that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business. 
that God has given to the children of men to be busy with. So from 1.13 to 6.12, Solomon says, I pursued knowledge. Let me tell you how it went. I pursued amusement. Let me tell you how it went. I pursued sin. Let me tell you how it went. I pursued possessions. Let me tell you how it went. I pursued vocation. Let me tell you how it went. I pursued philosophy. Let me tell you how it went. I pursued money. Let me tell you how it went. Why is this important? Um, It is not a biblical ideal to say that you can't know something without experiencing it. It's not a biblical or a wise idea to say, how can I know it if I haven't done it? I hear this all the time, especially in the generation that is coming up. I need to do it so that I can understand it. I need to experience it so that I can understand it. And can I tell you, really the only thing you're signing up for is regret. The only thing that you're signing up for is regret. There are certain things that, listen, God never wanted us to experience, never wanted us to understand. That's what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was all about. God's saying there's certain things I don't want you to experience. I don't want you to understand it. And yet we have this thing in us that is, that's fine for you, but I need to do it so I can understand it. Can I tell you, that's foolish. It's foolish. And so Solomon gives us this way to be able to kind of live vicariously through him, to experiment through him. And so some of you, the most important thing for you right now is I'm going to college, I'm getting my degree, I'm doing my thing. And Solomon's like, yeah, I did that. Let me tell you about it. I did that. Let me tell you about it. Some of you are like, man, I just want to have a good time. I just want to laugh. I just want to enjoy myself. I want to, you know, eat, drink, and be merry. And Solomon's like, I did that. Let me tell you about it. Some of you right now, you are... You're running headlong for sin, man. If anyone says it's right, you're, you're going the opposite direction. Can I tell you, Solomon calls sin madness and folly. That's what he calls it, madness and folly. Solomon calls sin, you've done lost your mind. That's what he calls it. And some of you are, are like, how am I ever going to know if this is really a bad deal unless I do it? And Solomon's like, let me just tell you. Let me, let me help you on, on, on this side of it. Some of you are in pursuit of the American dream, which is I got free from a boss and I got lots of stuff. And Solomon's like, I was my own boss and I got lots of stuff. Let me tell you about it. Some of you feel like if I get this job, whew, my life is set. Solomon's like, I had that job and the boss of that job and the boss of that job and the boss of that job. Let me tell you how it went. Some of you are in pursuit of knowledge and philosophy and understanding. Solomon says, I'm the wisest cat on the planet, man. Let me tell you how it feels. Some of you are in pursuit of wealth. If I just made this much more money, 25% is about what it is. If I just made about 25% more, then my stress would go down. My quality of life would go up. Solomon's like, I had all the money. I, didn't need, I was spending money on stuff that I didn't need. I, w- I just had all the money that I needed. Let me, let me tell you how it went and what it does is it protects you of the consequences of pursuits and understandings that God already teaches us. This is what's at the end of that road. That's what the book of Ecclesiastes is. Number three, Solomon shows us that human experience is circular. Human experience is circular. Here it is, Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 9. Are you still with me? What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is, what's the next two words? There's nothing new under the sun. This is an important thing for us for two reasons. The first is, I think that Solomon says this, and it should just calm us down a little bit. Because why? Because the enemy wants to isolate your experience and whisper in your ear, you're the only one this is happening to. You, this is actually, this has happened, never happened to anyone in the history of humanity, right? No one has lost their job. No one has had a marriage get sideways. No one has had a rebellious kid. No one has had the budget you had. No one has lived in the house that you've lived in. No one has the mother-in-law that you have. No one, no one, no one, no one. And what does it do? It creates in us a panic. It creates in us a panic. But Solomon says, look, not only has this already happened, it's happened an infinite amount of times and God's still on the throne and you'll be just fine. It's supposed to calm you down. It's also supposed to create humility in us. Humility in us. We uh, are living in a world that is, I want to be the first. 
I want to be the first in everything. I want, I, I, I'm special. I'm ahead of the curve. I, I'm always interested. I do a lot of reading just on culture and philosophy, especially as the world looks at the church and our faith. And it's always fascinating to me that you always kind of hear this, it's a little antiquated. Right? It's just a little old-fashioned. And it sits in this undergirding of the assumption that the human experience is just indefinitely up and to the right. That's what a progressive is, by the way. A progressive is somebody who basically feels like we're just going to keep getting better and better and better. We're going to evolve and evolve and evolve. And we need all of you antiquated bigots to just get out of the way and shut up so that we can get on with getting better and better and better. Read a book. Come on, somebody. All right? So watch. I will grant you that we are living in the most technologically developed time in the history of man. I'll grant you that. You know, I've got a, I've got a Bible that I bought on the internet that was delivered to my house. I have an iPad that I just punch information into, and if I hit a button, I can ask it whatever I want. Literally, 700 years ago, neither of these things, I I couldn't have had either of them. We're living in a time where uh, literacy is at an all-time high. We're living at a time where democracy, being able to vote for your leaders, is at an all-time high. 194 countries do it in some way, shape, or form. Clean water at an all-time high. Extreme poverty at an all-time low. We're living in a time that is more advanced in so many different ways. But here's the thing that hasn't advanced and hasn't evolved. You and me. We're still so greedy. We're still so afraid. We're still so uh, enamored with power. We're still so low on purpose and fulfillment, and we're still so terrible at loving our neighbor as ourselves. And in fact, if anything, the technology has exacerbated it, not made it better. (laughs) Because now if I don't like you, I can anonymously tell you you're an idiot. (laughs) If I I don't want to be your friend, I can unfriend you without having to have a conversation with you. Listen, we're advancing in certain ways, but in other ways, the most fundamental things that make us human, this is the same story that it's been since the beginning of time and humanity. And so Solomon says, listen to me, in in order for us to grow in wisdom, we need to grow in teachability, which means this, learn from one another. This already happened. I promise you what you're going through, somebody else in this building's gone through. I promise you. And, and, and more than that, and this is the wonderful blessing of our church, is that they probably went through it from a different perspective in a different time, with a different color of skin, with a different political persuasion, from a different part of town. All of those things the enemy wants to divide us around, God says, no, no, I want you to talk to each other. I, I, want, you, I want you to unite around the reality that you have differences and the unification of the body of Jesus under our head, who is Jesus Christ. In other words, yeah, we're different, but we're exactly the same and that we need and love Jesus. And so Solomon says, look, <laughs> this has already happened. Let's talk about it. Solomon says, you, you, you aren't the only one. Solomon says, this, let, me, let me tell you my experience so you don't have to pay the price tag. Solomon is an incredibly wise and incredibly transparent, and all of it is intended to do one thing, simplify my life. Simplify my life. Listen, I read a lot of books. I read a lot of books on simplification of processes. If it, I, I think people pay money to have things simplified, right? At work and in your own life, minimalism and all those kinds. Of, it's always fascinating to me, the, the newest book on minimalism, as though we don't already have an infinite number of books on minimalism, which seems ironic, don't you think? <laughs> Anyways. Solomon intends to simplify our lives. And he he gives us two things. Two things. I'm going to give you three because I think the first one is, 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 has some dimensionality to it. But two things that if you would just fully commit yourself to these two things, it would not only simplify your life, but it would, it would exponentially bless your life through the book of Ecclesiastes. Are you ready? The first is this, and you hear it from Solomon again and again and again, fear God, fear God. Now, last week through the book of Proverbs, I talked to you about this, and I want to give you a different perspective on 
what it means to fear God, because I think especially in our culture, the idea of fearing God is a little bit outside of our framework. And so I think there's three different types of fear. The first is just natural fear, natural fear, fear of heights, right? I remember the first time that I stood on the edge of the Empire State Building, and there's just that plexiglass, and you're like, wonder what would happen, right? <laughs> fear of heights, fear of snakes, right? Not, not a fan of, Satan was a snake. Right, you need to remember that, okay? <laughs> All right? Fear of public speaking. I'll, I'll tell you one that happened to me. I had the opportunity to go snorkeling in Belize some years ago, and, 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 and we drive out in the middle of the ocean and put all the gear on, which is basically just a snorkel and some flippers, and I jump into the water, and I look back at the boat, and the, the, the guide is, is dumping chum into the water. Now, I don't, I don't know if you know what chum is, but chum is like fish and fish guts and blood and brains and all that kind of stuff. And there'd really only be one reason that you would dump chum into the water, because you wanted, wanted sharks to come. Now remember, I'm already in the water. <laughs> and I watched this cat dump three buckets of chum into the water. And then I watch. Dun 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 again. And by the time he was done, there was probably 100 sharks in the water. Woo! <sighs> right? <laughs> My buddy is not apparently concerned with sharks as he was down in the middle and the guide said, you know, they're, they're basically safe, basically safe. Uh, my fear uh, caused me to make a decision. And that's what natural fear is supposed to do. It's, it's supposed to make you make a decision to stay away from the sharks, to step back from the ledge, to not stand on stage in front of a room full of people and speak, to not wrap a snake around your neck, especially when the only way they kill things is to squeeze the life out of them. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, that's one. Number two is damaging, damaging fear. And this is where the enemy takes the same issues that are natural fears and they go past making decisions and into consuming. And so this is something that, yeah, I understand that we're afraid that it might happen. I'm, I understand that we're afraid that they could get sick. I understand that we're afraid that we could go bankrupt. I understand that we're afraid that they might get elected. I, I understand all of that, but some of us have passed over natural fear, and now we're into damaging fear, which is sometimes very near cousin to sinful fear. Because it's not about fear anymore, it's about it's greater than God. It's more powerful than God. It's more consuming than God. On that same trip, I got certified as a diver, and I don't know if you have ever gone through that experience, but they basically take you out in the ocean, drop you into the ocean about 20 feet down. There were six of us, and we went through this process of identifying that we would be able to get our snorkel or our, 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 our oxygen and our, and our goggles off our head and back on, which is such a weird thing because I am very committed to keeping both, right? And so we drop down into the water, and we're about 20 feet down, but you can, we're in Belize, so you're looking up, you can still see the sun, and the, the water's very clear, but we've been swimming around enough that it's all kind of churned up and really salty and kind of getting in your eyes, and, and, and the, the guide calls me over, I'm going to go first, and so you have to swim in front of the guide for two or three minutes, whatever it is, and then he, he, he does this, and, and you're supposed to take out your mouthpiece, uh, what I mean by that is your source of oxygen, and, and you're t you got to throw it. And then you take off your goggles, and you hold them out, and then you count to 10, and then you put them back on. And so here's what happened to me. I, I did all that, and I, I tried to put my goggles back on, and they got caught on something. And so as I open my eyes, my goggles fill up with water, and I immediately start to panic because I've got contacts in, and i got churned up salt water in my eyes and it's burning and what it does is it starts to begin to panic me to the point that I forget to swim my source of oxygen. I get finally am able to do it and I get it into my mouth and I can't get it cleared because my, I'm trying to blink and I, I'm panicking full blown at this point and I have the conscious thought I am going to drown in front of a <laughs> diving instructor in Belize. Uh, I finally kind of get calibrated enough Stop worrying about your eyes. If you're dead, you won't need them, right? I open my eyes. I get the water out. I clear it. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm still even thinking about it this week. But I can feel my heart beat. Listen, some of you 
You have that on a topic that has nothing to do with diving. That if I bring it up, something happens physiologically, let alone spiritually, to you. That, that you start talking faster, your heart starts beating faster, you're more paranoid. Listen, you are consumed with fear. It's damaging to you and those around you. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of, here it is, self-control. Why? Because when I'm petrified, it is controlling me. God says, that's not from me. I give you a spirit of self-control. And so fear, natural fear, God-given fear, step back from the ledge, sis. Don't jump in the water with a bunch of sharks, Tim. <laughs> Damaging fear, consuming fear, right? And the third is godly fear. Now, this is an interesting topic because the Bible says that Proverbs 9 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And Solomon in Ecclesiastes 12 says, the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God. So the beginning and the end of the human experience is to fear God, it will put you on a path toward wisdom. And when you're looking back, you want to be able to say, I feared God through my life. Why? Because when the Bible talks about fear, it talks about it in terms like this, Psalms 130 and verse 4, but with you there is forgiveness that you might be feared. That sounds like a good thing and a not good thing, right? It, it, it says a little bit earlier, Proverbs 28 and verse 14, blessed is the one who fears the Lord always, and that word blessed means happy. You're going to be more happy if you're more afraid of God. 2 Chronicles 26 and Psalm 34 instruct us to grow in the fear of the Lord. Get more afraid and more afraid and more afraid so you'll be happier and happier and happier. What? So let me say it to you this way. Fear is supposed to do two things. Fear gives you this overwhelming sense, right? Fear is supposed to cause you to... Take a step back. Fear is supposed to have a consuming element so that it can control you to do or think or be something. So watch. When I consider God, there is an element, you see this in the Old Testament, of feeling overwhelmed that comes over me. That's why whenever people bebop into the presence of God, oh my gosh, and they fall on the ground because the majesty, the, as C.S. Lewis would call it, the weight of glory pushes them onto the ground. That overwhelming sense is supposed to control you to make certain decisions come to certain beliefs so that you will be a certain thing. In other words, God says that whole damaging fear is just a mutation. It's actually the opposite enemy-induced reality of what I actually want for you. One will make you an idolatrous, in bondage, uh, damaging to yourself and others, that kind of fear. The fear of you knowing who I am and in no way, shape, or form trying to minimize and shrink me will set you free, bless you, make you more happy, and be something that you want to orient your life around. The, fear, the size of God is supposed to overwhelm you. This is why whenever the fear of God, we say the fear of God is like reverence. No, it's not. The fear of God is like, whoa, whoa. Some of us would do well to grow in that. Some of us would do well to say, God, you are infinitely big and infinitely wise and infinitely power. And I'm afraid to contradict anyone that powerful and right. It would save us in many ways. The sense of overwhelmedness, grow in that, and that sense will control you in the same way I was like, stay away from the shark, step away from the ledge, okay? But it will control me in a way that is pleasing to God and a blessing, a blessing to me. Does this make sense to you? Yes. Out of this, then, comes the natural expression, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13, the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God, and it's really the same thing, keep his commandments. For this is the... Listen, what is the job of humanity? To know who God is and to do what he says is best. To know who God is, not as religion says. Religion says God is angry and God is grumpy and God is judgmental and God's out to get you. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God is infinitely beautiful. God is infinitely majestic. God is infinitely powerful. God is infinitely holy. God infinitely, eternally, and unconditionally loves you. And out of that... 
Of course you would want to obey him. Of course, listen, obedience in the Bible is not about this punitive, I do it so that God won't be mad. That's, that's not how the Bible talks about obedience. Jesus actually says it. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It's not this, re, this religious legal tally sheet. It's an understanding of who God is and what God says about me. And if God's that big and that majestic and that powerful and that right, I'm afraid to contradict him. Listen, I will tell you, there have been times in my life that I have very much wanted to do something apart from God. There have been times in my life that I have done something apart from God, and the thing that kept me when I was wise from it was I was afraid to step out of God's blessing. I was afraid to step out of the presence of God. Why? Because I've watched people do it over and over and over. And so there was girls I wouldn't date. There was things I wouldn't buy. There was places I wouldn't go. There was jobs I wouldn't take. Why? Because that's what obedience is. Obedience isn't a ledger, sleet, a, a ledger sheet. Obedience is, if that's who you are, I know that's what's best. And because you love me so perfectly, your, your provision in my life of direction is protective toward blessing and flourishing. You're not trying to keep something from me. You're not, you're not trying to be a killjoy. Listen, God doesn't say, don't date them, don't sleep with them, don't do that, because he wants to take joy out of your life. He's trying to protect you. God doesn't say, hey, don't, don't go into your, debt, into, your, uh, into your budget, into debt above your neck, because he doesn't want you to buy a new car and feel cool driving down the street. He does it because he knows that, that debt is like a noose around the joy of your life. And we've created this thing where God is this cosmic killjoy, not a loving father who says, trust me, I know what's best. If you just saw who I was, and this is why I, I, people, you know, always, what, Pastor, what should I do? I don't ever, I hate that question. Because I don't want to tell you what to do. I want to show you who Jesus is. Because if you'll see Jesus for who he is, you'll gladly do what he tells you to do. But if I say, do what God wants you to do, and you can't see Jesus, he'll feel like a cosmic killjoy. And listen, churches are full. My life at times has been full of, I'm just doing this because it's the right thing. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> Honestly, I think that sometimes we're going get, to get before God. And God, I did the right thing my whole life, and then I died, and here I am. Like, what's God supposed to say? Thanks? Sorry I ruined your life? No, you want to say, God, I trusted you. God, I saw you for who you were. I saw your power. I saw your majesty. I saw your goodness. And, and God, the times you gave me the wisdom to obey, I saw you, not the rule, I saw you. And I was glad to do it because you're incredible. And because I love you. And because I love you. And so Solomon says, let me simplify your life. Look at God and do what he says. <laughs> That's pretty simple. Hey, it's not easy. Don't get me wrong. It's not easy. But it's pretty simple. God tells you how to handle your marriage. It's not easy. I get it. God tells you how to handle your finance. God tells you how to handle your time. God says, I've given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. But we have this thing in us that we're more afraid of missing out, FOMO, than we are of God. We're more afraid of, I just got to go through it so I understand it, than of God saying, listen, I love you too much to just let you do this. And so Solomon says, let me simplify your life, fear God, and obey him. And then number two or three, however you're dividing it up, live with the end in mind. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9, rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. I love this because we in church world, we spend a lot of time telling kids no. Don't do that. Don't, do, don't go there. Don't do that. Don't try that. Don't. And, and Solomon says, no, man, do it. Do it. You, hey, how many of you would, would, would give a large sum of money to be that age again? Yeah, of course, right? Don't raise your hand too high. That'd be awkward, all right? <laughs> Some of you are like, oh, God, please. No, but, all right, relax. <laughs> Solomon says, yeah, have experiences. Yeah, enjoy yourself. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. Yeah, man, go nuts. This is my life. You're right, it is. I want to do it. You can. 
Just know that the beginning of the story is God as your creator and the end of the story is God as your judge. Solomon says, hey man, I did it. I get it. I get the drive to experience and you should. But you also want to keep in mind that you're going to be accountable. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1. You say, well, I'm not young anymore. That's not the point. The point is right away. Right, listen, as early as possible. I don't know where it became boring for God to put a kid in a Christian home, save a kid from a Christian home, direct his life toward a life of purpose that glorifies God. Why? I don't know why that's boring. I pray every day that that's my kid's testimony. As soon as possible, give your life to Jesus. As early as possible. And some of you say, man, it's been a long time. I know. God is a restorer. Today. Come on. Come on. Today. Not tomorrow. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't, don't wait till Monday. Don't wait till this afternoon. Some of you, you know, you know that you've been doing it and you know it's not working. Give it to him. Give it to him. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 11, the words of the wise are like goads, okay? With a nail fir firmly fixed are these collected sayings. In other words, Solomon's saying, look, you, you can try this any way that you want. You're always just gonna come back to this is what's true. Not easy. That, that goad is like a, a stick with a nail on the end. Ugh, I, don't, I don't like how that feels. But they are given by one, what, what's the, the next letter? Capital S. Solomon's going, this, this is, I know that people say this is my wisdom, but this is actually the great shepherd's wisdom. I want to end this way. I want to I ask you to take a six-month challenge. Say, six months? Yeah, six months. You got that thing. We all have that thing, right? Come on, say amen. amen. Yeah. That we've been trying to do it our way. I'm asking you for six months to just do it God's way. My budget's a mess. Just do it God's way for six months. My marriage is a mess. Would you just do it God's way? My relationships, would you, for six months. You say, I can't do it for six months. Fine. 30 days. In fact, I, I would say it even more directly. We've got a play for you. The play is we come to church every Sunday we can. We gather to lift up the name of Jesus, to pray for one another, to enjoy one another, to open up God's word. I want you to go to growth track. I want you to understand that God loves you and has got a plan for your life. I want you to be in a small group. I want you to get onto the dream team. I want you to be in your Bible every single day. I want you to have friendships around you. I want you to be waking up on Monday. Run our play for six months. Why? Because you ain't got a play. So run our play for six months, and in that six months, if God gives you a better play, tell it to us, and we'll do your play. Because we want God's best in our lives. But I'm asking you, I'm begging you, stop trying to do it your way. It doesn't work. It damages you. It damages those around you. It's not complicated. It's very simple. Fear and obey God. You're accountable. You want to fix your finances? Do it God's way. You want to fix your relationships? Do it God's way. You want to fix your marriage? Do it God's way. Doesn't mean it's painless. Do it God's way. Trust him. Believe him. Lean into him again. And find him faithful and true and wise and good and loving. You receive this today? We hope that you enjoyed the service. If you need prayer for any area of your life or just need someone to talk to, please send us an email at amen at visitgraceway.org. If you live in the Kansas City area, we'd love to have you worship with us. You can let us know you're coming by going to visitgraceway.org and we'll have a member of our dream team waiting to make your experience great.